speak in a lighter vein, we spend 40 minutes sampling the delights of chocolate. If you're going to be an actor, you can forget all about leading a normal life. Nine to five are just numbers in a makeup box to me. I wouldn't know one end of an office from another. I don't even know who I am half the time. Like the reckless troubadours of old, the actor strolls from village green to village green, singing for his supper and picking up what scraps of food he can. It's an inordinately insane existence. There is, of course, one rather important difference between the modern actor's life and that of the strolling medieval player. Telly. Television is the means by which the contemporary performer peddles his wares to the peasant of the present. It is very much the latter-day troubadour's power base. I like to think of it as my own little portable village green. Yes, yes, OK. For the performer, the crucial difference between theatre and television is the size of the screen. It's a much smaller medium, so everything has to come right down. Voice, gestures, even underpants if it's a Dennis Potter. Television is fiendishly difficult to master, but the rewards can be decidedly pleasant. This is all telly. I'd probably be living in a cardboard box now if I confined myself to theatre work. And you'd be back on the streets. So let's take a look at some of the techniques we need for effective television acting. We begin with a demonstration of the delicate art of financial plot laying. What, from this lot? Our room has it. He's in big trouble financially. He likes a bit of a gamble, so I hear. Anyway, he wants to be out of the States for a bit. The backers have got everyone else here working for peanuts, of course. But here, Henry Hoffman, he's on a damn good screw. <laughs> Pedigree spade work, nicely loosened up at the end there with some good cigar skills. You see, you have to hook the viewer early on, otherwise he's off to the kitchen before you can say Nigel Havers. Let's look at some other examples of financial plot pumping. I think we're relying far too heavily on existing markets. I am paid an incentive for meeting my management objectives. Because by the time it was advanced, or would have been advanced, the takeover had already been made. Now, the key to successful business plotting lies in a simple device. Yeah, Henry Hoffman, he's on a damn good screw. Ponging. You have to pong the names. Ponging is a very, very good habit to develop. It clears confusion and whets the viewer's appetite for the arrival of the pongees later on. Sadovsky. Clavering. H.T.J. Winthrop, B.S.C. Nearly all the acting we've seen so far has been in the style we call Series 60, the performance mode used for all hour-long television drama. Series 60 is all about hero against the odds, so an extremely important character is the villain. Yes, it's a pity about that pet sergeant of yours turning up. Could make things very, very awkward. The Series 60 villain needs a wide range of physical skills. He has to be comfortable with portable phones, briefcases, toothpicks. He has to be able to run across gravel. But above all, he must know how to handle a champagne glass. There's no way he can work out what's actually going on. Normally, I don't drink champagne. Very well, thank you, Sergeant. But tonight's an exception, I think. Now, the keen-eyed among you may have noticed that so far there's been something lacking, and it's a big something. I'm referring, of course, to the single most important feature of the Series 60 genre, the vintage car. The vintage car transports the performer from A to B in a way that is both efficient and pleasing to the eye. Good 
parking skills and the driver completely untroubled by the adverse weather conditions. You know, it always amazes me that as actors, we're not only required to look after the spiritual health of the nation, but we're also expected to act our socks off at the crack of dawn in the freezing depths of winter. How do you do? How do you do? And here's Peter Barkworth having to act in some truly appalling conditions. In fact, Peter is one of the most in-demand and versatile Series 60 actors in the country. Excuse me, isn't that uh, Tony Fairley over there? He can pong like an angel. Tony, the man Mary went to the gambling clubs with. And he takes a champagne bottle in his stride. Uh, come on, are you saying you've been so appallingly brought up that you can't open a champagne bottle? Here we see Peter behind the bank manager's desk. I want to see if it's possible for you to continue trading without the bank lending you more money. But he's equally comfortable on the other side. Transfer 6,000 from our deposit account to cover the overdraft. Barkworth, then, a genuine all-rounder. So, ponging, driving vintage cars, a good head for figures, and thermal underwear. Just some of the essentials the actor will need if he is to get regular TV work. In fact, there are so many serious skills that if an actor wants to fit even half of them into his perf, he has to go at a fearful lick. He upstaged me something cruel. But he was a nice tough. <laughs> Nought to 60 in 0.3 of a second, taking minutes off the running time. Just tonight. Let me go, you fat drunken cow! But ultimately, there is a limit to what an actor can achieve in 60 minutes. If he's really going to open the throttles, he needs 90 minutes at least. So now let's look at an example of what we call prestige 90 acting, the style used exclusively between the hours of 8 and 10 on a Sunday night. What more could I do? You, you could have annexed Serbia and made Prince Alexander Emperor of the Balkans. That's what I would have done. Well, immediately we can detect certain superficial stylistic variations, brighter costumes, clippy diction, but the emphasis is still very much on spade work and ponging. On the face of it, it's very similar to Series 60. There is, however, a crucial difference. You may have spotted it already, but in case you haven't, let's see some more. He was a soldier, every inch a soldier. The quality that makes Prestige 90 as different from any other acting style as chalk is to cheese is, of course, additional facial hair. We wouldn't have been able to begin fighting these foreigners hadn't shown us how to do it. We knew nothing about it, neither did the serves. <laughs> oh, the impertinency of womankind. I still say rot. This is my own collection of prestige beards and moustaches. Some of them given to me by other actors. Many I made myself. It's not in any way comprehensive. It's just an eclectic collection of the sort of thing I happen to like. Every item in the collection is an actual piece of working facial hair. You know, I often think that there is no more pleasant a distraction from the pressures of acting than a quiet Sunday afternoon with one's gauze and needle. I find a deep inner peace from threading in gossamer strands and watching a firm new beard or moustache come to life on the wig block before me. Now, there is a sort of halfway house between Prestige 90 and Series 60, known as Classic 60. This is usually an adaptation of a gigantically important Victorian novel. Clara Peggotty Barkis! <laughs> it's 
It requires fearsomely punishing name work. Mucker digs, chipkins and bullock. And Mr. Frederick Fairley. There simply aren't enough hours in the schedule to mention each and every character before they appear, which means that some actors have to enter totally unponged. Last teaming! Cadet Howard's home from the sea. In the unlikely event of actors ever being consulted about anything, we would always far rather act for 90 minutes than 60. The scripts are more restful, and you never have to stay in a horrid location hotel with a bed that sends you back into spasm as soon as you look at it. And, of course, it's an ideal form for non-drivers. Oh, there, my old buddy. Ah! Another plus is that the bad weather problem simply doesn't exist, because most European drama takes place indoors. And when it doesn't, there isn't a single climatic condition that can't be recreated by the special effects boys. <laughs> oh. Here we see authentic Bulgarian weather. My dear, oh. what a lovely surprise for us. Ooh. Norwegian weather. Kalaharian weather. And our own much maligned English climate. So far, we've been concentrating on sucking the audience into our acting world through high-definition beard work, ponging and plot pumping. All terrific skills to watch, of course. But I'm a firm believer in showing a character warts and all, the defects, the flaws and the vices. And now, a characteristic piece of flamboyance from Michael York. A double inhale while driving a vintage car. So odd. You don't know how odd it is. And since we're on the subject of vices, we might as well look at some general drinking techniques. So if you'll come with me to the drinks table, we'll be a... Now, you notice what I did then. In television, you must give the cameraman enough time to follow your rise. So that's a black mark to me, not to the estimable Graham, who's doing a sterling job. Thanks, Graham. Just have a look at some rises while I get the drinks ready. <laughs> this year, it's uh, Jersey history. The most popular series 60 drink is, of course, whiskey. We take a glass of water and simply squeeze in a used tea bag. For the most popular Series 60 drink of the 80s, however, ordinary H2O and a teaspoon of liver salts. For red wine, we use extract of beetle, and it's very important here to make sure that the mixture is palatable. Mm. It's delicious. Classic 60 characters drink brandy, for which we use Madras curry powder. I'd like your honest opinion. <coughs> and in Prestige 90, you can use anything you like. Couldn't matter less, because of course you've got a goblet. Every actor relishes the freedom of Prestige 90. But oddly enough, as far as Joe Viewer is concerned, the most popular drama of all lasts for only one third of that time. Just half an hour from titles to credits. As we can see, the actor has to have the engine running at 90 mph right from the word go. It's an old actor's maxim that the 30 minute thrash really sorts out the men from the boys. With so little time, drinking has to be clear and quick. A perfectly simple explanation. Smoking, of course, is strictly forbidden. Don't smoke. As is any kind of foul language. Quite honestly, I couldn't tell me. Our, our... <laughs> Spade work and rising skills have to be razor sharp. It's hopeless. You're right. 
Incidentally, I think you can tell a hell of a lot about an actor by the way he handles himself on a sofa. It is an absolutely crucial piece of furniture in all three acting styles. It is in many ways the vintage car of studio drama. Of course, it's impossible to apply a rigid set of rules to television acting, and really, I'm the last person to lay down the law about anything, in acting as in life. If I see a convention, I flout it. But having basic guidelines is useful. And just because one learns to pong in a beard or work a sofa doesn't necessarily mean that one stops being an untamed spirit. I still regard myself very much as a rogue or a vagabond, strolling from town to town, biting my thumb at danger and cocking a hefty snook at authority. In fact, if I'm not an affront to society, I reckon I'm not doing my job properly. Ah. Excuse me, this may be the last meal I get for some time. No, no, you've had yours. <laughs> It's all Oscars and Emmys, darling, next Thursday when the naked actor of the...